Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate Department Occasional Lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Australia's Indigenous elders, past and present. Uh, on a happy note for our regular attendees, it's our first non-rainy Friday for quite some time, so I'm very happy about that. I'm also very happy about today's lecture, and uh, as you can see, I was so distracted chatting to our lecturer that I did something that I never do, which is start a couple of minutes late. So for that, I apologise, but I'm sure that you will forgive me when you have heard today's lecture. Now today it's actually the third in our um, lectures commemorating the centenary of World War I. In 2014 we had Dr Brendan Nelson talking about the role of Parliament in going to war. Last year in 2015 Aaron Pegram from the War Memorial talked about politicians at war. But today we're, we're going to have a lecture from Professor Tom Frame about the 1916 conscription referendum, which uh, I don't need to tell you has huge contemporary resonance and uh, in its day was a, a, a sort of cataclysmic event for Australians and Australian society. Now, Tom Frame is probably one of those people who needs no introduction in Canberra, but I shall give you an introduction nonetheless. He's a noted historian and ethicist. He's well known to many of us through his writings and through his work in various guises. Currently, he's Professor of History at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, and Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society. Uh, he was Anglican Bishop to the Defence Forces and uh, then Director of St Mark's Theological College. Many of you will have read all, all or, or one or more of his uh, well-known books on um, Anzac Day, on um, the HMAS Sydney, HMAS Voyager, on Harold Holt, um, and also on moral injury, unseen wounds in an age of barbarism. So we're going to have a very thoughtful and uh, provoking lecture, I think, today. And I'd uh, like you to join me in welcoming Professor Tom Frame to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honour to contribute to the Senate Occasional Address Series, and I do thank, thank Dr Lang for the invitation to be here and for all of you for attending. I've been thinking about this subject of conscription, conscience and parliament actually for most of my life because I was born during the most turbulent moment of the Cold War. That's the first week of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1960. Two, I was actually relinquished at birth and adopted, and when I did meet my mother when I was 32, I pointed out the fact that the Cuban Missile Crisis was underway, and she pointed out to me in return that she was somewhat distracted with other things. <laughs> but 1962, the year that I was born, was also the same year the first Australians were deployed to South Vietnam as military advisers. The Vietnam War was fought all through my childhood until I was a teenager. Each day's fighting featured on the nightly news. And with my father, I attended anti-war demonstrations and anti-conscription protests in Wollongong, where I was raised. I can also remember Anzac Day parades at which young Vietnam veterans, many of them national servicemen conscripts, were jeered by opponents of Australian participation in the conflict. And as a child, feeling so sad that that had happened. Now, as we mark the passage of 100 years since the people decided against making overseas military service obligatory in the Great War of 1914-18, I'll begin by examining the recruitment of military manpower, the recognition of conscientious objection, and the Parliament's role in the events leading to the 1916 referendum. I then want to look just briefly at the other occasions on which these matters achieved national significance. That is in 1943, 1968, 1990, and in 2003, before concluding that the 1916 referendum is really the first instalment of an evolving and expanding case study on the character of government authority, 
and on the limits of the state's coercive powers. So let me begin then with conscription. Now prior to the 20th century, most European states obliged their citizens to render some form of military service when there was a threat to the nation state. Before Federation in 1901, service in the Australian colonial forces was entirely voluntary. So those who participated in the Maori Wars of the 1850s and 60s, the Sudan War in 1885, the Anglo-South African War in 1899 and the Boxer Rebellion in 1900 chose to enlist and elected to serve overseas. The supply of volunteers usually exceeded the demand for personnel. Now in 1901, the newly formed Commonwealth Government assumed sole responsibility for national defence and was empowered by the Constitution to raise and to maintain naval and military forces. The 1903 Defence Act determined that uniform service would be voluntary, except in time of war, when men could be conscripted for home defence. A bill for universal, meaning compulsory, military training for Australian men aged 18 to 60 was introduced by the Deakin government in 1909 and supported by Lord Kitchener, the most famous soldier in the British Empire, when he visited in 1910. Now, when hostilities began in August of 1914, when they continued beyond Christmas of that year and showed every sign of being part of a protracted conflict, when the list of Australians injured or killed in combat exceeded tens of thousands, when enthusiasm for the war waned and recruitment declined, when more men were needed to maintain the existing strength of the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF, than were volunteering, the Labor Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, decided to act. As an additional 5,500 men per month, per month, were required to ensure the AIF remained operationally viable, Hughes resolved to send men undergoing universal military training to the first AIF for overseas service. This was a substantial commitment for a small population. Those who had enthusiasm for the war by 1916 had probably joined, but 5,500 a month just to remain viable was a very substantial impost upon a small nation. But the necessary legislation would not pass the Senate, where Hughes faced strong opposition, particularly from members of his own party. He could, however, introduce a bill to enable a referendum to be held, a bill that would pass with the support of the Commonwealth Liberal Party, then headed by Joseph Cook. Now, perhaps as an indicator of what was to come, the bill only just passed. But for the first time in the new nation's history, a question would be put to the people for their judgment. And so the Military Service Referendum Act of 1916 provided for a non-binding plebiscite. It was not strictly a referendum because the Commonwealth already had the necessary power to conscript men for overseas service. But the Act's wording provided for what it called a referendum. Why was it wanted? Well. Prime Minister Hughes had two reasons. The first was securing a symbolic popular mandate to transcend deep political division. He could say to his colleagues, the people have spoken, look. The second acknowledged that in 1916, conscription wasn't an administrative matter, it was a matter of life and death. So you ask then, was this an early instance of wedge politics? Well, yes, it was. But the wedge was applied within Hughes's own party rather than the opposition. So on this day, 100 years ago, the people of the Commonwealth were asked in amazingly tortuous prose, so let me read it slowly, the following question. Are you in favour of the government having, in this grave emergency, 
The same compulsory power over citizens in regard to requiring their military service for the term of this war outside the Commonwealth as it now has in regard to service within the Commonwealth. Who drafted that? But that was what was put to the people, the first question put to the people. Now the yes case was largely pragmatic. It stressed the need, the urgent need, for more fighting men. It pointed to the increased prospects of victory in the war with an enlarged AIF, and it made much of Australia's duty to the empire. The yes case was popular among conservatives and the middle classes. The no case sought to highlight issues of governance and principles of conscience. And I think the Australian worker newspaper summed up the main no argument in its core. It said this, society may say to the individual, you must love this or you must hate that. But unless the individual feels love or hatred springing from his own convictions and his own feelings, society commands him in vain. He cannot be ordered to love. He cannot be ordered to hate. These passions must find their source within his soul. And so the no case stressed that it was wrong to force men to fight against their will, to act in ways that might violate their conscience, and to oblige them to risk their lives when those at home were safe and secure. There were also genuine doubts about whether the additional men would make a real difference to the war's outcome. And there were the inevitable protests that surely Australia is already doing enough. But confident that the yes case would easily prevail, some three weeks before the referendum, Hughes directed all eligible men aged between 21 and 35 to report to their local military authorities where they would be medically examined and assigned to a unit. And because it was difficult to prove personal identity in those years, and there was a lively trade in fraudulent exemption certificates, the men called up in October 1916 were fingerprinted. This highly unpopular measure, when added to resentment at Hughes's presumption of the referendum outcome, greatly helped the no case. It also served to be a mini poll on the government's popularity in the electorate at that time. This was because Hughes's personal standing as a strong leader, heading a unified team, had been slowly eroded by the gradual collapse of his cabinet through resignation and defection. So in what was a surprise result, the referendum was defeated with 1,000,000 160,033 people responding no, and 1,087,557 people answering yes. The turnout was 82.75% of eligible voters, while 97.36% of the votes cast were valid. I mean, you only had to say yes or no. I don't know why it was that complicated, but there we are. Significantly, voting at this referendum was not compulsory. So people chose to be there. It wasn't later that uh, referendum voting was made compulsory, but on this occasion it wasn't. Still, listen to the figure again, 82.75% of people decided that they would cast their vote. The referendum was lost unexpectedly in New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia, but it was passed in Western Australia Victoria, Tasmania, and notably the Federal Territories. But we need to see the result turned on just 72,476 votes. It was a narrow margin, and therefore with all narrow margins, that wasn't the end of the matter. So when Australia was asked to provide a sixth division for the Western Front in 1917, and the need could be not met by volunteers, Prime Minister Hughes, now leader of the newly formed National Labor Party, went back to the people on the 20th of December, 
1917 with the question, and he'd worked out how to word the question by then. It was simply this. Are you in favour of the proposal of the Commonwealth Government for reinforcing the Commonwealth forces overseas? So I presume the people knew what the proposal was, but they were asked whether they were in favour or not. Hughes's plan was to have any shortfall in volunteer recruitment met by compulsory reinforcements of single men, widowers and divorcees without dependents aged between 20 and 44 years who would be called up by ballot. Well, that referendum was defeated with 1,015,159 in favour, but 1,181,744 against. It was a larger defeat in 1917 than 16, and left Australia to stand with South Africa and India as the only participating dominions not to, in, to introduce conscription for the Great War. Now, in thinking about what was at stake in 1916 and 1917, it's important to separate opposition to conscription with recognition of conscientious objection. They're actually, in one sense, different things. Opposition to conscription was, and in some quarters is, based on political, procedural and practical considerations. What do I mean? Let me give you an example. Opponents to conscription might argue that the case for compelling a section of the population to render military service is either poorly conceived or wholly unconvincing. We may not be against conscription, but you haven't put up a good enough argument for it. Opponents might take exception to the method by which men are selected, such as a ballot based on date of birth. Or you might object because certain categories of people are exempted from obligatory service, such as, and I say this somewhat ironically, the clergy. You might think, well, why should they not have to do it, whereas everyone else does? There might also be opposition to deploying unsuitable or inexperienced amateur soldiers for tasks better undertaken by trained and experienced professionals. So opposition to conscription can take many forms and may not necessarily involve any dimension of conscience. Conscientious objection, though, is focused on the objective of conscription, which is involuntary or compulsory military service during wartime. And the possibility that someone rendering such service might be required to kill another human being. Now then, and now, professing certain religious convictions and possessing particular philosophical beliefs might preclude the taking of human life under any circumstances, including armed conflict. Now most societies respect these convictions and beliefs, exempting those professing them from compulsory military service in wartime. So during the 19th century in Britain, for instance, Quakers were excluded from the operation of the 1803 Militia Act, while Russia allowed Mennonite Christians to pay a special tax in lieu of military service. Now, objection of this kind usually comes from pacifists, and that pacifists comprise a small minority may explain why many governments have agreed to a compromise with those holding, sincerely, pacifist convictions. This has generally been the attitude of Australian governments since the time of federation. But the question arises, how does government, not competent to necessarily comment or understand matters of belief and conviction, how does it deal practically and politically with these things? Well, I would argue somewhat imperfectly, although the intent is a little better than the result. The 1903 Defence Act defined conscientious belief as, and I quote, requiring a fundamental conviction of what is morally right and wrong, which is so compelling that the person is duty bound to follow that belief. In one sense, not, not a bad place to start. I have a sense of right and wrong, that is wrong, I cannot be compelled to do it because it would violate my conscience and therefore my integrity as a person. But the Act recognised 
the validity of conscientious belief for those who could also prove that the doctrines of their religion forbade them to bear arms or perform military service at any time. Now, it's interesting that Australia was the first nation to grant complete comprehensive objection, uh, of exemption on such grounds. But there was an emphasis in the Act that exemption was limited to combatant duties and was restricted to individuals demonstrating membership of an organisation formally professing pacifism. So in one sense, it wasn't enough to say, oh, I'm a pacifist. You had to also demonstrate that you were part of a group that formally professed pacifism. Now, you might say on the one hand, that's just an administrative convenience. You can deal with people as a group. But I think part of it was wanting to try to show that these weren't conveniently acquired, that someone's belief was affecting their belonging and their behaving, and perhaps it was raising the threshold slightly. But that's certainly the way in which the Act put it. But notably, no specific religious test was required of conscience after 1910. Now, the 1916 conscription debate highlighted two contentious issues that were to have continuing significance. The first was the difficulty of reconciling the state's authority to compel individuals to render military service with the entitlement of individuals to seek exemption based on conscience. And the second concerned the state's willingness to concede that it did not have an independent existence over and above serving the citizens that were the source of its authority. The referendum, I think, also demonstrated that compulsion and conscience are ethical issues, but they have political dimensions. So this meant that conscription stood apart from many other government activities. And I think acknowledging the moral gravity of obliging someone to take a human life and accepting that some citizens may be morally constrained from doing so, we would probably say is a mark of mature democracy and a tolerant society. And to a very large degree, I think that's what we were during the period of the Great War. Could we have done better? Of course we could. But in relation to other states at that time, and given the short period of time between Federation and the period we're talking about here, I do think there is political maturity beyond the years of those who constituted the Commonwealth. Now, the argument then, and the argument which might be mounted against the reintroduction of conscription in the future, is that the political case for increased military manpower ought to be improved rather than the state's coercive powers exercised more vigorously. If you want more people to fight, then improve the argument. Certainly in the Second World War, when many more men volunteered, the case seemed to be compelling and people did. It's better to have, you would argue, willing volunteers than resentful conscripts. And so in 1916, Australian parliamentarians realised the gravity of these issues and they resolved to share the burden with the public, directly and personally. So in a sense, the parliamentarians are saying, we are not going to stand alone in accepting responsibility for sending men to their deaths. The people ought not and will not be able to abrogate their collective responsibility if they vote yes. So don't blame us, the parliamentarians would say, for sending these people to their deaths when you are complicit by voting yes in the referendum. Notably, the vast majority of serving soldiers who were participating in the referendum voted no. They had seen the horrors of war and would not insist that others share the experience, nor did they want to fight alongside reluctant comrades with whom they might not be able to trust their own lives. Interestingly, the churches, as the chief guardian of the nation's moral conscience, generally accepted the justness of the Great War and the necessity of conscription for overseas service. Now, although there was no officially endorsed Anglican position on military service or conscientious objection, Francis James noted the striking fact that between May of 1916 and January of 1918, no Anglican voice appears to have been raised against conscription in the church press or in any other synod. So when people say, why was this sectarian? It was certainly from the Anglican point of view, consonant with proper citizenship, 
that people should volunteer for service and, if not, be compelled to do so. As the largest denomination, leading Anglican churchmen, and their voices were prominent at that time, strongly urged a vote in favour of conscription. The most notable public opponent of conscription was the Roman Catholic coadjutor bishop and from May of 1917, Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix, who referred to the fighting in 1914-18 as just an ordinary trade war. He was the only Australian Roman Catholic leader to respond positively to the 1917 peace proposals of Pope Benedict XV, who advocated the complete abolition of obligatory military service. Now the failure of the two referenda in the First World War was not lost on politicians during the Second World War. Now although compulsory military training was resumed in October of 1939, war with Germany having been declared the previous month, general conscription did not begin until, until hostilities commenced against Japan at the end of 1941. By January of 1943, and with the Labor Party in power, military manpower again became a pressing issue, and one that it could have divided the Labor Party a second time. But Prime Minister John Curtin prevailed, and his party's policy platform was changed. So in February of 1943, legislation was introduced to define Australia in a manner that included the territory of Papua New Guinea and the islands of Indonesia and British Borneo, New, New Guinea then being a League of Nations protectorate administered by Australia. So all troops, all troops, including the Citizen Military Forces, the CMF, were liable for service in a special South West Pacific zone. But this policy created, in fact, two armies, a volunteer army that could be sent anywhere and a conscript army that could only be deployed to the Pacific zone. Now, this naturally complicated defence planning because some units were an amalgam of second AIF volunteers and some of CMF conscripts and volunteers. But these complications aside, and they were manageable, John Curtin's decision reflected the acute Japanese threat to the nation and acknowledged that American conscripts were now defending Australia. So his decision to proceed embodied an acknowledgement on a couple of levels that there needed to be compromise with views made plain in the Great War, but he thought a compelling case for more Australians to be involved in combat operations in those territories you might say could reasonably be called part of Australia or at least our sovereign responsibility. In the post Second World War period, Australian forces consisting entirely of volunteers, of course, went to the Korean War, the Malayan Emergency, the Indonesian Confrontation. Although compulsory military training was reintroduced in 1951 as part of a national service scheme that continued until 1959. But then conscription was reintroduced using provisions contained in the National Service Act of 1951, and it happened without parliamentary debate, not that it was technically required, but it happened on the 10th of November, 1964. Now, it's important to note that national service was reintroduced in anticipation of possible armed conflict with Indonesia, rather than as part of an escalating commitment to South Vietnam. That hadn't yet happened. The act exempted conscientious objectors on the grounds of religious and non-religious beliefs from either all military service or from combatant military service, the distinction being uh, re or reflecting the nature of the beliefs held. But total exemption was granted on the basis of deep-seated and compelling conscientious objection. And once again, ministers of religion and theological students were specifically exempted. Now, national service in the 1960s, when it was reintroduced, was actually not that politically controversial. It hadn't been really politically divisive in the 1950s. And in a Gallup poll that was taken in late of 1964, it showed that 71% of Australians were in favour of the scheme at that time. 
and only 25 per cent were against. Attitudes changed a little after the 29th of April 1965 when Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies advised Federal Parliament that an infantry battalion would be deployed to South Vietnam for combat operations. And the one RAR deployment, though, was an all-volunteer force. The following month, the Defence Act was amended to allow national servicemen to deploy overseas, with the first Holt government deciding in March of 1966 that NASHOs, national servicemen, would serve in South Vietnam from mid-1966. Support for national service was then at 63% in favour and 33% against. In fact, by October of 1970, 58% still agreed with national service and 34% were against. Curiously, 8% were undecided. I don't know how you could remain undecided at that point, but 8% were. In September of 1971, there was a poll of 16 to 20 year olds and 53% of them supported the continuation of conscription with the proportion in favour increasing with the age of respondents. So yes, the tide turned on thinking about Vietnam, but in terms of national service, you have to concede that for the great period of the Vietnam War, the majority of Australians, even people most likely to be conscripted, were somehow in favour of it. Surprisingly, by August of 1967, and the death of the first national serviceman, Errol Nowak, the percentage of those who were polled showed that 42% believed that national servicemen should be sent to Vietnam, and only, and rather, and 49% believed that they should remain in Australia. So a balance had kind of turned, but not perhaps to the extent that you might have thought given the protest movement in this country. Prime Minister Harold Holt explained when he decided that national servicemen would go to South Vietnam, that the United States was sending its conscripts to South Vietnam and Australia, like John Curtin had said in 1943, was obliged, if you like, to do likewise. Now, to avoid the accusation that conscripts were carrying a disproportionate burden of the war fighting effort, later legislation during Vietnam limited deploying units to less than 50% national servicemen. So between 1964 and 1972, nearly 64,000 men were conscripted. Of that number, 19,450 national servicemen would serve in Vietnam, with around 200 killed. Of the regular army, 21,132 personnel deployed to South Vietnam, with 242 killed. Now, it's notable that early in their training, many national servicemen were quietly invited to express their interest in serving in South Vietnam or some other destination. Because three out of four conscripts fulfilled their duties within Australia, Malaysia or Papua New Guinea. National service could actually be avoided by a number of means, by perhaps enlistment in the citizens' military forces, deferment on the basis of particular circumstances, such as I'm still completing my education, or exemption through conscientious objection. But opinion was divided on whether the war in South Vietnam had a direct bearing on Australia's security and whether it justified, whether it justified the deployment of conscripts. Now, disagreement on these two points led to calls for the recognition of selective objection, also known as objection to particular wars in 1966. Commentary focused on what were considered two unsubstantiated assertions in the National Service Act. First, that it focused on war rather than on wars, and it assumed that all armed conflicts possessed comparable moral status. And the second argument was that disagreeing with an elected government's decisions itself could be a matter of conscience. What the government is doing is wrong. And for me to participate, it may not be morally wrong, it's politically wrong, but it's still wrong and therefore there should be some compensation for me feeling in that way. Now, while critics of the Act consider that a minority submits to the decision of the majority in a democracy, the decision to wage war, it was said, raises moral issues so serious 
that compelling someone to render military service may reasonably be regarded as a matter of conscience and therefore an exception to the rule. And it wasn't until late 1968 that the courts clarified the scope of conscientious belief. So in Thompson's case, heard before the High Court, one Bruce Thompson claimed that the phrase, any form of military service, in section 29A1 of the National Service Act, meant that exemption was possible if an individual objected to any form of military service, including service in a particular war. The court was split. Chief Justice Barwick disagreed. The case was lost. And the point was made, if you didn't like conscription and you thought national service was bad, you could always join the CMF. Now, you could imagine a whole lot of reasons why you shouldn't compel people to join the CMF, but the argument was if there's going to be compulsion, everyone needs to be compelled. Now, the fact that there was a ballot, you were drawn out of what was called the death lottery, you might say was already fairly fickle and therefore unfair. But this issue of, I object to not all wars, but that particular war was a point that didn't go away. Now, those who were opposed to recognising it said, well, hang on, if we say you're not against all war, but against that war, what about if you say I'm not against all taxes, but that tax? And the argument was it could, in principle, open up a theory of selective objection to government authority, and that could not be canvassed. It was also the case that people linked military service to jury duty. And there's all sorts of ways of opting out of jury duty and the same sorts of capacity ought to be made because you don't necessarily have to be against jury duty in all instances, but there may be specific cases that you could argue that I should not be obliged to be a jury member and that ought to be accepted. Now, the end of the Vietnam War did not mean these issues went away. They did not. And even after the National Service Termination Act of 1973, there was still discussion about, well, what will happen in the future? And very often, the sensible time to talk about these things is not when a war is raging, but when there is extended peace. We're not talking about a particular instance, we're talking about general principles. Well, the debate was moribund, moribund until Michael Tate, a Labor senator from Tasmania, proposed legislation to recognise a right of selective conscientious objection. He later introduced a private member's bill into the Senate proposing changes to the National Service Act. Now, the matter further languished until 1990 when Senator Tate, who was now the Justice Minister and couldn't be ignored, circulated the first draft of a Defence Legislation Amendments Bill. It included recognition of selected conscientious objection for conscripts although the last National Service trainee had been discharged from the Army in 1973. He wanted to establish the principle that, at least for conscripts, you might argue that it would logically flow to volunteers as well, but at least for conscripts, they would have the right of objecting to a particular war in future conflicts. While this legislation was being considered, the first Gulf War occurred. There'd been talk about recognising selective conscientious objection when, in April of 1990, Saddam invaded Kuwait. Australia decided it would immediately respond. One particular sailor, leading seaman Terence Jones, failed to report to HMAS Adelaide before the ship deployed to the Gulf of Oman to enforce United Nations sanctions against Iraq. Leading Seaman Jones decided that he would not attend his place of duty and defended his action by saying, while he was absent without leave, I am not a coward and I'd be prepared to fight for my country. But I am taking a political stand because this is not our war. We are just following the Americans. I am prepared to die to defend my country, but not to protect the United States oil lines. So he inferred that it was moral to be political in this instance. The trouble was the Defence Legislation Amendments Bill hadn't been passed in Parliament. It was only for conscripts. Jones was absent from place of duty and a subsequent court martial. He was found guilty, being guilty of absent from place of duty, sentenced to 21 days detention, reduction in rank to able seaman, forfeiture of four days pay, and then he discharged at own request. I'm not quite surprised about the last bit. But in one sense, and I know because I was then working in the office of the Chief of Navy, that there was a concerted attempt to make a point that this kind of, it was said, disobedience could not be tolerated, that people joined on the understanding there was an unconditional commitment 
to serve. Now, this issue didn't go away, and nor would you expect it to, in 2001 in relation to Australia's participation of the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq in 2003. Both operations provoked a great deal of discussion about the justification of Australian participation given the absence of any clear, unambiguous, immediate or direct threat to the Australian people and their national interests from either Afghanistan or Iraq. I was moving around the ADF quite a lot at that time as Bishop to the Defence Force. I was actually trying to encourage moral conversation about both of those engagements. And I have to say that, and this is my judgment, that the vast majority of Defence Force members had not actually thought much about the difference between moral objection and political dissent. I thought the majority did not know how to differentiate between them. And even fewer had thought about what they would do if confronted by a moral objection within their service until it actually was staring them in the face. In other words, another human being asking questions of what they were doing that could no longer be escaped. Now, objection to military service always implies some degree of conflict in ideas between the state and the person who objects. It is the case, I think, that always and everywhere we should take this tension seriously. That if we are going to compel to do things to people that do violate their moral integrity, that we should be quite clear about the circumstances and the conditions under which that might occur. I believe the time is now right for another conversation about these kinds of things, because we have enough background of the last 15 years to raise a whole lot of questions that don't just belong to those who are serving, but to those who send them and those who sustain them. Because when people deploy overseas, they don't do so as private individuals, they do so as members of the Australian Defence Force with a legal mandate, and everywhere they go, they wear a uniform that now has what on their sleeve? Our nation's flag. To close. The 1916 conscription referendum highlighted and to some degree worsened sectarian tensions within Australia, tensions which have since dissipated. But it has left a positive lasting legacy, I think in the form of greater respect for conscience. Since joining the Navy 37 years ago as a 16 year old, I have noticed a very substantial shift towards respect for the personal convictions of uniformed men and women. This is a welcome development. But conceptual challenges remain. I would contend that the two most pressing challenges are explaining the distinction between objection and opposition and ensuring that moral conversation is not prescribed as incitement to mutiny within or beyond the ADF. Trying to pursue mission objectives with both effectiveness and efficiency while giving conscience due regard, I know, is not easy. I realise there is impatient with suspected or declared conscientious objection among volunteers. Impatience reflected in the retort, well, if they don't approve, they're free to leave. But I would respond to that in two ways. First, what if their objection is valid because a planned action is morally objectionable? The presence of a conscientious reflection in a unit may be crucial to preventing immoral or potentially illegal behaviour. And second, should a career be ended because a person thinks that their participation in one activity is incompatible with their moral conscience and then seeks a form of alternative military service while continuing with their career? The pressing issue is the difficulty of differentiating morals from politics to the extent that such a distinction is ever possible. I, like you, want an apolitical ADF. But the members of the ADF are not people without political minds and beliefs of their own. I've met people claiming to profess a moral objection when their position is really no more than political dissent. But the level of education and awareness of these issues, in my view, is woefully low. At the moment when people express that they have a moral objection to something they're required to do, it's dealt with quietly and confidentially with individual cases being personally managed. That's workable because these cases are few in number, while those involved usually prefer privacy and anonymity. But I'm not sure this approach will be adequate given the evolving weapons, tactics, scenarios, and corporate risk aversion associated with current and likely future operations. 
Nonetheless, I am confident that we can host a mature discussion that will be principled and pragmatic in balancing the nation's military manpower needs with respect for individual conscience. It's a discussion that necessarily involves parliamentarians and their staff, ethicists, and of course, uniformed people. I've already involved my academic colleagues at UNSW Canberra and the military staff at the Defence Academy in these kinds of conversations. And I know that I would continue to welcome the chance to engage with the very able minds that work in this place as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Frame. Didn't I tell you it would be thought provoking? Now, anyone who would like to ask a question or make a comment, would you like to come to the microphone in the centre of the room downstairs or um, upstairs? There's also a microphone in the gallery. And we have a very fast person to the microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, Terry Futrell is my name. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It was a most uh, enjoyable and sustaining uh, presentation. Uh, just two things I'd like to just clarify along the way that I, I, I sort of didn't quite uh, pick up on the resolution. One was the Cook, the Prime Minister Cook legislation. Did that pass when, when you mentioned that it was supported by Kitchener? Oh, yes, it did. It, yes. it did pass. So we did have. So there uh, was a statute that, that provided, provided for universal military training, training for 18 to 60 or 65 year olds in the ensuing period. So that did get up. Lord but, Kitchener supported it. It was put up by Deakin and it was passed the following year. But did year. it relate to service? Or? No, training. Just training. Because right. there was already provision of service in the Defence Act of 1903. Okay, yeah. Uh, and the second point was the, the Michael Tate amendment, that got lost in the wash, did it? When, or did that... No, it didn't. It, you know, no, it, it became part of a cluster of amendments in the Defence Act in 1992 and made Australia the only country in the world that has legislated for right of selective conscientious objection for conscripts. And I think we remain the only country in the world to have um, so legislated. All right, thank you. That, I just wanted to clarify those two points. Thank you. No, very thank much. you. That's very helpful. Is there anyone else who'd like to ask a question? Yes. Thanks, Tom. Kevin Vassarotti. Um, two questions. One, uh, probably clarification. Uh, is national service still on the statute books? I mean, does the, does the government have the power to conscript people? I don't believe it does. The National Service Termination Act of 1930, 1973 terminated national service. There's legislation that could be pulled out hurriedly and I presume put to parliament and passed. Mm. But at the moment, I don't think the Commonwealth would, I believe, as the force and effect of the 73 Act, have to, uh, if you like, bring the Act back to parliament. In 1964, the Act was dormant. Uh, my understanding is it, it doesn't yet, it doesn't, um, it's not empowering the government to do that now. So they, but if they did bring it back, they don't need a referendum as such. They just no, know. and they didn't need a referendum during the Great War either because the, the, there was no constitutional amendment involved in anything that was happening. Yeah. It was to try to get a mandate for a particular action, the same way this parliament could decide matters in relation to the Marriage Act. It yeah. doesn't require amendment to, yeah. to, uh, to the constitution. So they called it a referendum, but plebiscite's better, a better description of what it what it is, and if it came back tomorrow, it wouldn't need it wouldn't need that. The Parliament could decide. Here is a bill to reintroduce national service. Uh, it'd be put to the Parliament, passed, and then presumably the, the government could decide to act on it or not. Hmm. The second question is relates to the power of the Prime Minister to declare war. I guess so we involve us in war, and your discussions that you're initiating. Does that include it in um, in your um, wide view of this? Look, this is a, a matter that I've discussed with the 25th Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. Uh, I've discussed it at length with him because I was involved in some conversations before the war in Iraq. Uh, I had certain understandings which I made plain in The Australian. Uh, I regretted the things that I had said before the war and wrote an equally large article in The Age saying that I was wrong. Uh, that earned me notoriety in Al Jazeera but I nonetheless thought it was the right thing to do. Previously, I had believed that I didn't think necessarily uh, a vote say of both, both houses of parliament sitting together, taking a motion to declare, our, uh, to declare that we would involve our people overseas. I hadn't taken that view. 
but I've moved in that direction since that time because it does seem to me of such gravity, not just to the people we send, to the people they meet on the other end, that it does seem to me that this is a matter of gravity, that we may formalise it, regularise it, and you might, if I understand your question, suggest that it be beyond, for instance, the National Security Committee of Cabinet, that it might be put to a, uh, a broader test of support, if you like. I have to say, Kevin, that I'm moving in that direction, I, and I know that Mr Howard hasn't moved at all, uh, but we can have a friendly exchange on that. But I welcome the chance to tell him why I think, in relation to Afghanistan and Iraq, for instance, that there could have been other ways of doing it and more people from whom to seek a mandate. The question arises, though, would you require that to happen if we quickly had to go to another Rwanda or Somalia? What would you think? Would you want both Houses of Parliament sitting together to have a resolution to that fact? Or would you say, no, that's the kind of thing we ought to be doing. We should do it straight away. Let's not, let's not uh, delay. Let's go and do that. So because we don't declare wars anymore, we have deployments and we have armed conflicts and things like that. Putting a fence around that thing that you want a bigger mandate for is a challenge in itself. But I should stop because I've asked you a question. I know. Well, I, I, I think it depends on the circumstances, obviously. And, uh there's no one simple answer, yeah. but uh, it's certainly a matter for discussion. But Iraq and Afghanistan, I, I, I have to say that I'm moving in the direction of saying that the way in which it was done, it, it would have been better with a much, land, much larger parliamentary mandate and therefore with greater political legitimacy. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Another question? Yes, sir. Tom, I'd like to ask you something about where the, where the dust has already settled. I was a, a strong opponent of the American rape of Vietnam. I'm wondering if you would like to tell us what did the Australian Armed Forces and the American Armed Forces achieve at first for ordinary Americans and ordinary Australians, um, and what did it achieve for ordinary Vietnamese? I note that Robert McNamara, the main architect of the war against the people of Vietnam, a few years before his death, as you know, turns up at the University of Hanoi and says to the staff and the students there, among other things, we didn't know anything about you. I've now come to the conclusion that our participation in that war against you was wrong. Now, it's in his book, The Fog yeah, of War yeah. and the film. Can I say... So what do you think? What do you think? What about the, the, these phony theories about the dominoes? I can only answer one question. Right. Thank you. Um, I would have to say that, you know, together with McNamara and many others, uh, both the decision to conduct the war in Vietnam and the manner in which it was conducted uh, are, are, are low points for Australia and for Vietnam, uh, for Australia and the United States. I mean, I think there's a great deal of regret about how in which it was done and the difficulties of achieving practical outcomes. I mean, it was the case that in South Vietnam, at least, there was a number of instances where the people made democratically their mind plain that they did not want to be connected to North Vietnam. That wasn't a system of government that they wanted, and I think it's, that has to be conceded. Having said that, the way in which the war was fought, it does seem to me, uh, removed from countries like ours, the difficulty of saying we had a moral mandate to be there. I don't think anyone kind of would say that. Uh, I'm always sensitive when I talk about though Vietnam. I only remember it as a child growing up and being moved to tears in 1969 with Vietnam veterans being booed. I thought the target was wrongly chosen. But I would say that when I talk about it is that people did go there. People had their own views that it was right. They were doing something that was positive and productive. And I'm always anxious not to say, um, that they did something that was inherently evil, wrong, or that there was nothing good in what they did. The war itself was misguided, and the conduct of it, I think everyone has said, uh, was a low point, both in diplomacy and in the conduct of a campaign. We still learn lessons from Vietnam, both diplomatic lessons, political lessons, as we ought, and even in terms of how to do counterinsurgency, not that we do that any better, but at least I think we're better informed about the bad things that, or the bad decisions that we might make. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually have a, a question about the 
1916 referendum, so-called. It's incredible that at a time when voting was not compulsory that the turnout was so extraordinary. But how did people get their information about the terms of the the, the, the question or the or the issue. I mean, clearly the church has played a big role. Um, was there such a thing as a, a yes or no case? How, how did people, how did the ordinary voter get to engage with those issues? Um, I think broadly there are three ways. One of them is that they had personal contact with their with their member of parliament. That's if they were in a major urban centre and not where it was difficult for the local member to get out and about. And so uh, that was principally a way. So we've got plenty of records of speeches given by the MP for wherever it may have been in support or against the referendum question. The, sec the second one was, of course, uh, newspapers and people relied heavily, um, not having radios, not having naturally television, uh, and the internet was thought to be space age, that uh, they would just acquire newspapers. And um, it's one of the great sadnesses that I think, uh, you know, good thought produces good writing. Uh, and that one of the reasons a lot of our public conversations are impoverished is because people don't write. It's just grabs of words. When you have to write, you have to put words on a page that don't have all the, if you like, sometimes the trickery of, of oratory. And so papers were important. And so things like the Australian Worker saying that this paper supports this view, or the bulletin, you know, here is an argument, uh, those things were important. In terms of interaction with other people, where would you have a discussion? Um, it was the case, you look at the, the census, uh, you're looking at, say, 96% of the population belonging to four major denominations. Church going is probably only about regular, regular being fined as monthly and better is probably only 35% in that period. But people would hear a sermon, have a discussion or whatever else it might be, bring that home and that would continue because there weren't other ways of, uh, that was a form of entertainment. So I would say they're the three main things, which is why, and there's more in what I've uh, what I've written but not what I have read concerning the churches because they were so influential in shaping votes. It's not possible for us to say all Anglicans voted this way or Catholics that way, but if the measure of the oratory and the vehemence of it, uh, if it had any effect, then you'd think, and it was said to be sectarian, you'd think people would line up according to what their priest, pastors, ministers were, were urging them. Um, it's true too that people who had served or were thinking about serving, uh, they, had a, they had a lot of skin in this game, so to speak. And so it was a matter of lively conversation. Um, those who were coming back, for instance, who'd been wounded, um, there was not so much attempt to get them to not speak, but they were powerful advocates when they did speak against the yes case. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, that 82% of people turned out is highly significant. I mean, we first of all went to having compulsory registration for voting and later on for compulsory voting. And uh, if I could put in a small plug, our, uh, our university is having a, a one day conference looking back on the 1996 election, the first year of the Howard government on the 16th of November. And why that's relevant to this conversation is that uh, Albert Langer uh, advocated a way of voting in the 1996 election, which was then kind of uh, made invalid immediately afterwards by the parliament here. But it seems to me to be in one sense illiberal if you say on the one hand, oh, I don't think people should be compelled to vote, then over here people should be compelled to vote, but only within these narrow parameters over here. I have a, and my colleague, Andrew Blythe, is the centre manager where I work. Andrew's working on this. I think they're important issues. When it came to the referendum, you had yes or no, and people didn't need to be compelled, and that 82% were there. The interesting thing is when Senator Payne, Herbert Payne, moved a motion for compulsory voting, he said, you know, the people can't be allowed not to be interested. <laughs> and his view was that having compulsory voting would lead to a happy outcome where people would be, you know, knowledgeable about their nation's affairs. Making them vote would mean that they couldn't ignore politics because there'd already been, Rosemary, a, a notable decline in voting for the nine elections where it was where it was not compulsory. It was moving. I'm a strong believer in compelling the people to vote. Sorry, I am. Because it doesn't have that factor that I observed when I was in the UK. I had Anne Boleyn's church in Kent, and I was uh, you know, the local vicar. And a man came up to me and said, oh, vicar, you must pray on Thursday for rain. And I said, why should I do that? And he said, because the socialists won't vote. Uh. <laughs> and we're talking here in uh, 1997 that that view still held, that the rain, the rain would have a democratic effect. 
and I didn't want that to be the case. So that's why I hold, you may disagree with me and please do, that uh, we take out a whole range of extraneous factors. But making the people decide in 1916, I think was important. It was an ancillary thing to say, if we're gonna do this, you've put your hand to it as well. But I think it was an important thing. Well, on that note, I think our, our time sadly has, uh, has expired. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Professor Tom Frame for a wonderful lecture. Thank you, and we'll see you all again for the next lecture, which is quite soon, I believe.